This company is always, this is a great affair, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of companies don't realize the importance of having fun, the importance of doing things. This company has always done that. And I've been through a lot of fun things, and I'm glad to be back. Um, I've, I've divided these remarks into two different categories. One, it would be, it would, it would be a disservice not to talk about Walt Disney, the businessman, and just talk about Disney as an entertainment entity in the United States. Now, so I want to, first I want to talk about Disney and what he left, and then I want to talk about the trends I think we're going to see this year, which, by the way, I think this year is going to be an excellent year, and I'm not hyping it. I think it's going to be a year just like 2013 was. You can work hard and make lots of money. And that's exactly what we need in real estate. But um, let me talk about Disney first. He was born in uh, 1901, which is a significant year because those for early years in the 20th century um, birthed a lot of people who changed the way this country is and gave us a lot of things that we have. Now, Disney was one of them. Um, he died in 1966, and he was 65 years old. He died a young man, chain smoker all his life, and died of lung cancer. He's one of those that came along in which people didn't think there was any tie-in to uh, smoking and cancer, and he's one that was victimized by it. He was in World War I. Uh, and, and in World War I, he was already a cartoonist. He knew he could draw. Um, and he went to school to learn how to draw better, but and he became known as a cartoonist more than he did as a businessman, and that bothers me. Uh, in World War I, he drove an ambulance. And his ambulance, as you can imagine, was covered with cartoons. Uh, but Ernest Hemingway was dri driving ambulances in World War I, so they went through World War I. And then Disney started, he elevated himself, and he started making videos or movies. And you know, one of the things that we have that is one of the most important marketing thing, tools we have now is videos. And he was making them in the, er, in the, thir, in the early 30s. Um, and that generation of the 30s created more people, more geniuses than this world has ever seen before or since. And I'm going to talk about those in just a minute. But here are some things that he did as a businessman. First of all, he went to, after his early days, he went to um, Orange County, California and bought some orange groves. He bought so many he went broke. I mean, he didn't have any more money to spend, but he had this vision of Disneyland. You see, the, the creative people and the people who do absolutely startling things, like Sam Walton, um, these are people who could see what they were going to do long before you and I would understand it. Frank Kessler saw Glenmore long before a tree was ever cut out or a brick was ever laid. Because I can tell you, before he graduated from UVA, he had talked about going into real estate, and I know who he was going into real estate with, and it was Dick Nelms. And they talked about the name of the company, and it was going to be Real Estate 3. Three fraternity brothers were going to open a real estate company here, and, and Frank opened it up. Dick came to Richmond and opened up Bowers, Nelms, and Fonville, and I don't know who the third person was, but all three of them had that creative ability to see where they were going. Now, the, the next thing that Disney did, he opened up Disney World. He finally got through the financial trauma, and he opened up Disneyland, which the world had never seen anything like it. 55 million people go through there a year. When you think about 55 million people, and there's nothing that attracts the crowds that Disneyland and Disney World attract. Um, at, at the opening ceremony, Ronald Reagan opened Disneyland, which he was not one of these people that was unknown, but he was not one of these famous people. I taught U.S. history in high school, and I taught, and I took almost every history class I could take at Virginia Tech. 
And I can tell you what, the decade of the 30s was known as the end of World War I, the beginning of World War II, and the worst depression this nation had ever seen. That was what the decade of the 30s was. But it was more than that. It was a decade in which the geniuses came to play. And this is where Disney really got his start. So the next thing he did after he opened Disneyland, well, he passed away and never saw Disney World on the East Coast open. And Orlando was nothing but an orange grove and a wide spot and a highway. Before Disney, it was nothing. You could go buy oranges. You could buy them from one of those little shacks on the side of the road. They already had them bagged up for you. You know what I'm talking about. Well, that's what Orlando was. So he bought more land than had ever been purchased by one person um, and, and passed away. But here's the thing about smart people. Smart people leave smart people in charge. It's something about hanging around with smart people that everybody progresses. See, because they got smart by hanging around with whom? Smart people. And, they, and it becomes infinitum that these companies just keep going on and on and on. Microsoft. Bill Gates leaves Microsoft, and what do they do? They keep on going. Sam Walton dies, and Walmart becomes the largest retail store in the world. Steve, I mean, retail, the largest employer in the world. Steve Jobs dies, and what happens? Uh, Apple computer goes off of the mark. So then, on top of all of this, uh, Disney hires Steve Jobs to be on the board of directors of Apple. Now this is long after Walt Disney is dead and gone. And now, to show you what they're still doing, they track who comes to Disney World. They know the people who came to Disney World because most of them stayed in hotels that they owned. They invented databases. You have to think about this. Disney did not have any, any technology more than an ad machine on his desk and a radio. There was nothing else. Televisions had just been invented. But in his creative days, there was no technology. He couldn't pick up a phone and call somebody. He couldn't take out a smartphone and read a text. There was none of that. It was not even a, a handheld calculator. You couldn't even do percentages. You had to do them in longhand. There was no buttons to push. And how anybody ever created it all is amazing. But then now, here's what they're doing in Lake Buena Vista. Lake Buena Vista. How many of you have been to Disney World in Orlando, Florida? There are two things that are absolutely startling. One is Lake Buena Vista. They have a housing development like none that I had ever seen before because I used to jog through it and I said, I wonder if we'll ever have anything like this in Virginia. And then it dawned on me, they created a whole city. I mean, Orlando, Florida is the next biggest city, but Disney World is the big city. And then, on top of that, not only did they do that, but they track who goes there. They have now opened a new subdivision in Disneyland off of a database and it's called Golden Oaks. The prices start at 1.7 million. Now you think about it, this is a time in which real estate ain't really hot, but they know who has the money. It's like you and I having a database. The people who struggle in this business, I don't care what the market is, are the people that don't have enough customers to work with. And if you don't have a database, you're never gonna have enough customers to work with. So it starts at 1.7 million, and they listed the name of the person who bought the first house. And in the description of who he was, it said he and his family had been to Disney World 300 times. <laughs> you think about it. You think about it. You think Walt Disney wasn't a businessman? He's known as something that he was, which is one of the most brilliant minds that ever lived. But he's not known as a businessman so much. But he left us techniques. You did one right here. You're a visionary group. That's a Disney. It's like your GPS is an Einstein. Einstein invented GPS. The theory of relativity is the GPS. That's how it calculates where you are, where you're going, how long it's going to take you to be there. These guys invented this stuff with no calculator or computer. Think about it. And here we are dealing with not knowing how to use a computer. 
We're dealing with numbers, the likes of which we've never had anything like the technology we have. And the hardest thing to do now is to communicate with people, and we have more communicating devices than we've ever had. And there are people that just never return telephone calls. There are people who are always late. <laughs> and you know who they are. You can make a list of them sitting right at the table. But anyway, <laughs> the, amazing, the amazing part of this Disney thing in the 1930s is there was a man alive at the time. His name is Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie realized that the world had never seen the genius that we were seeing in this country. His great fear, this is Carnegie Steel now, a very wealthy man, lived in Chicago. His... His thought was um, civilization will never record the greatness, and as a result of it, we'll never know what separated great people from average people. And he wanted to do something about it. Disney was alive at the time. Thomas Edison was alive at the time. Henry Ford was alive at the time. uh, Walter Chrysler was alive at the time. Harry Firestone was alive at the time. And the list goes on and on. Carnegie did it, identified a list of 25 people. He hired a guy named Napoleon Hill to interview him. He said, I will pay you more than you've ever made before. I want you to interview these 25 people. He said, all I want to know is to find out what is the common thread that runs through them, if there is one. But more important than that, I want to know what makes them different. What is it that they believe? What is the... Did they have talents that the rest of the world doesn't have? So Napoleon Hill started out, he was 30 years old when he had this job. He started interviewing them. He couldn't get interviews with them. So Carnegie had to call ahead and get him to interviews. He says that the best interview he did was with Henry Ford. Now think about Henry Ford. He is known as automobile guy. He's the one that believed that we would have automobiles when the world was riding around in horse and wagons. You with me? Can you imagine what people said? You're going to have to get rid of these horses and wagons? We're going to have this automobile? And it's going to run on gasoline. And they had never seen a gallon of gasoline in their life. And here's this idiot in Detroit that is going to build an automobile. You with me? They tried it for being a lunatic. But that's not where he made all of his money. You know where he made his money? And you are still funding it. The Ford family makes more money off of Kingsford charcoal than any other thing. The next time you buy a bag of Kingsford charcoal, it was invented by Henry Ford in 1920-something. He invented it when he invented the automobiles. That's who these people were. So anyway, the interviews went on and on, and finally... Napoleon Hill had interviewed all of them. He didn't interview Disney. He had interviewed all that would give him an interview. So the day came in which he was going back and talk to Andrew Carnegie and tell him what the difference was in these people. He walked in, he didn't have a, he didn't have a briefcase, didn't have notes, didn't have anything. And Andrew Carnegie thought that he'd been had by this young kid. He paid him a lot of money and he has no report. And he said, are you prepared to talk to me about what the difference is? I said, yeah. I said, do you have a report? He said, it wasn't enough words to write. He said, they're all the same. He said, in what respect? He said, here's what they believe. They believe that they can achieve anything that their mind can can conceive. They believe that they can think that they can do it. And every one of them is exactly the same. Who could have ever thought that 55 million people a year would go see Mickey Mouse in that group. (laughs) And then they built another thing called Epcot Center. And you know why they built Epcot Center? They built Epcot Center so that the parents and the grandparents would go with the kids because Epcot Center was about the future. Disney World was about the present and the past. You could go to Disney World and still see a parade on Main Street. You could go to Disney World and still buy buy loose candy in the candy store. You could do everything in Disney World you did for the past 40 years.